Hi, Dr. Alex here, and welcome to what I hope will be an enjoyable series to many people, although it may be of niche interest. Specifically, this series is transcribing the audiobooks of Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Life, the Universe, and Everything, and So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, as read by Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore, for those who don't know, is the actor who played Marvin the Paranoid Android on the original radio production of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the TV series which followed soon after. This is the genuine Marvin the Paranoid Android, except no substitutes. When the radio series first aired in 1979, I was about five years old, and it was then repeated multiple times over several years on Radio 4, when it was first broadcast. My father was an avid fan of Hitchhikers as soon as it was produced, had the books, which I still have copies of, and listened to the radio series repeatedly, as did I growing up, to the point where I think I overtook my father in terms of my fandom for the series, and would insist that we listen to it whenever it was on, on a Saturday usually, around about lunchtime, and it just had to be on. On in the background so I could listen to it. Later, in school, having consumed the radio series multiple times and the books, I discovered the audiobooks in the school library, as read by Stephen Moore. And of course, I got these out and listened to them repeatedly as long as I could. Obviously, I had to take them back. They were, after all, library books on tape. Recently, I got to thinking about these books on tape and how enjoyable they were. Being read by Stephen Moore, it had the voice of Marvin the Paranoid Android whenever he read the Marvin lines. And of course, the correct voice for the other characters that he also read in the radio series. And simply as a narrator, he has an excellent reading voice. So I remembered how much I enjoyed those as a child and then thought, I wonder if they're still readily available. As it turns out, they are not. They have never been produced on CD or online. They only exist in that original tape form. And those tapes themselves are incredibly hard to find, as I discovered as I attempted to dig them out online from various shops and sources. I have now got all tapes available. I would like to stress, I do not own the copyright for these tapes. I do not own the copyright for the original material, and I'm recording them in these videos in an effort to preserve them, because they are on magnetic tape, magnetic tape degrades, and there aren't very many of them left around as far as I can see, and there's been no effort to reproduce these professionally in another format, either online digitally or even just on CD. So if you do own the copyright for these, please, by all means, copyright claim these videos as the material is your own, but I would request humbly that you do not block them, just monetize them. My channel isn't monetized, so I'm not going to make money from this anyway, but I would like people, future generations, to be able to access these amazing recordings and enjoy Stephen Moore's work long into the future. Anyway, enough about my motivations for doing this, and now here is, so long and thanks for all the fish, cassette side four. This cardboard just fly around the sky and start doing all kinds of stuff. You don't know anything? No. Arthur, it's been almost inexpressibly delicious conversing with you, chum bum, but I have to go. I'll send the guy with a camera and the hose. Give me the address. Uh, I'm ready in writing. Listen, Murray, I, I called to ask you something. I have a lot to do. I just wanted to find out something about the dolphins. No story. Last year's news. Forget them. They're gone. It's important. Listen, no one will touch it. You can't sustain a story, you know, when the only news is the continuing absence of whatever it is the story's about. Not our territory, anyway. Try the Sundays. Murray, I'm not interested in whether it's a story. I, I, I just want to find out how I can get in touch with that guy in California who claims to know something about it. I thought you might know. People are beginning to talk, said Fenchurch that evening, after they'd hauled her cello in. Not only talk, said Arthur, but print in big bold letters under the bingo prizes, which is why I thought I'd better get these. He showed her the long narrow booklets of airline tickets. Arthur, she said, hugging him, does that mean you managed to talk to him? I have had a day, said Arthur, of extreme telephonic exhaustion. I have spoken to virtually every department of virtually every paper in Fleet Street, and I finally tracked his number down. You've obviously been working hard. You're drenched with sweat, poor darling. 
"'Not with sweat,' said Arthur wearily. "'A photographer's just been. "'I tried to argue, but oh, never mind. "'The point is, yes.' "'You spoke to him? "'I spoke to his wife. "'She said, well, I thought you mightn't believe any of this, "'so when I called her, I used the telephone answering machine "'to record the call.' He went across to the telephone machine and fiddled and fumed with all its buttons for a while because it was the one which was particularly recommended by Witch magazine and is almost impossible to use without going mad. The voice was thin and crackly. Perhaps I should explain, it said, that the phone is in fact in a room that my husband never comes into. It's in the asylum, you see. Wonko the Sane does not like to enter the asylum, and so he does not. "'I feel you should know this, because it may save you phoning. "'If you would like to meet him, this is very easily arranged. "'All you have to do is walk in. "'He will only meet people outside the asylum.' "'Arthur's voice at its most mystified. "'I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Where is the asylum?' "'The voice said, "'Have you ever read the instructions on a packet of toothpicks?' "'On the tape, Arthur's voice had to admit that he had not.' "'You may want to do that. "'You may find it clarifies things for you a little. "'You may find that it indicates to you where the asylum is. "'Thank you.' "'The sound of the phone line went dead. "'Arthur turned the machine off. "'Well, I suppose we can regard that as an invitation,' he said with a shrug. "'I actually managed to get the address from the guy on the science magazine.' "'Fenchurch looked up at him again with a thoughtful frown "'and looked at the tickets again. "'Do you think it's worth it?' she said. Well, said Arthur, the one thing that everyone I spoke to agreed on, apart from the fact that they all thought he was barking mad, is that he does know more than any man living about dolphins. This is an important announcement. This is Flight 121 to Los Angeles. If your travel plans today do not include Los Angeles, now would be the perfect time to disembark. They rented a car in Los Angeles from one of the places that rents out cars that other people have thrown away. Late in the evening they drove through the Hollywood Hills, along Mulholland Drive, and stopped to look out over the dazzling sea of floating lights that is Los Angeles. "'I know that he will be able to help us,' said Fenchurch, determinedly. "'I know he will. What's his name again that he likes to be called?' "'Wonko the Sane. I know that he will be able to help us.' Arthur wondered if he would, and hoped that he would, and hoped that what Fenchurch had lost could be found here, on this earth, whatever this earth might prove to be. He hoped, as he had hoped continually and fervently since the time they had talked together on the banks of the Serpentine, that he would not be called upon to try and remember something that he had very firmly and deliberately buried in the furthest recesses of his memory, where he hoped it would cease to nag at him. They found that they were suddenly feeling astonishingly and irrationally happy. Wonko the Sane was tall, and he gangled. When he sat in his deck chair, gazing at the Pacific, not so much with any kind of wild surmise, any longer as with a peaceful deep dejection, it was a little difficult to tell exactly where the deck chair ended and he began, and you would hesitate to put your hand on, say, his forearm, in case the whole structure suddenly collapsed with a snap and took your thumb off. But his smile when he turned it on you was quite remarkable. It seemed to be composed of all the worst things that life can do to you, but which, when he briefly reassembled them in that particular order on his face, made you suddenly feel, Oh, well, that's all right then. His house was inside out. Actually, inside out, to the extent that they had to park on the carpet. All along what one would normally call the outer wall, which was decorated in a tasteful interior-designed pink, were bookshelves, also a couple of those odd three-legged tables with semicircular tops which stand in such a way as to suggest that someone just dropped the wall straight through them. The roof folded back on itself, like something that Moritz C. Escher, had he been given to hard nights on the town, might have dreamed up after having been on one, for the little chandeliers, which should have been hanging inside, were on the outside, pointing up. The sign above the front door said, "'Come outside,' and so, nervously, they had. Inside, of course, was where the outside was— Rough brickwork, nicely done pointing, guttering in good repair, a garden path, a couple of small trees, some rooms leading off. 
and the inner walls stretched down, folded curiously, and opened at the end as if by an optical illusion which would have had Moritz C. Escher frowning and wondering how it was done to enclose the Pacific Ocean itself. Hello, said Wonko the same. Good, they thought to himself. Hello is something we can cope with. Hello, they said, and all surprisingly was smiles. For quite a while he seemed curiously reluctant to talk about the dolphins, looking oddly distracted and saying, I forget, whenever they were mentioned and had shown them quite proudly round the eccentricities of his house. It gives me pleasure, he said, in a curious kind of way, and does nobody any harm that a competent optician couldn't correct. They liked him. He had an open, engaging quality, and seemed able to mock himself before anybody else did. "'Your wife,' said Arthur, looking around, "'mentioned some toothpicks.' <laughs> he said it with a hunted look, as if he was worried that she might suddenly leap out from behind the door and mention them again. Wonko the Sane laughed. "'Ah, yes,' he said. "'That's to do with the day I finally realized that the world had gone totally mad and built the asylum to put it in, <laughs> poor thing, and hoped it would get better.' This was the point at which Arthur began to feel a little nervous again. "'Here,' said Wonko the Sane. "'We are outside the asylum. "'Go through that door,' he pointed at the first door "'through which they had originally entered, "'and you go into the asylum. "'I've tried to decorate it nicely to keep the inmates happy, "'but there's very little one can do. "'I never go in there now myself. "'If ever I am tempted, which these days I rarely am, "'I simply look at the sign written over the door, and I shy away.' "'That one?' said Fenchurch, pointing rather puzzled at a blue plaque with some instructions written on it. "'Yes. They are the words that finally turned me into the hermit I have now become. "'It was quite sudden. I saw them, and I knew what I had to do.' "'The sign said, "'Hold stick near centre of its length, moisten pointed end in mouth, insert in tooth space, blunt end next to gum.' Use gentle in-out motion. Well, it seemed to me, said Wonko the Sane, that any civilization that had so far lost its head as to need to include a set of detailed instructions for use in a packet of toothpicks was no longer a civilization in which I could live and stay sane. And in case it crossed your mind to wonder, as I can see how it possibly might, I am completely sane, which is why I call myself Wonko the Sane, just to reassure people on this point. Wonko is what my mother called me when I was a kid and clumsy and knocked things over, and sane is what I am and how I intend to remain. Shall we go on to the beach and see what we have to talk about? They went out onto the beach, and he started telling them about the angels with golden beards and green wings and Dr. Scholl sandals. Yes, he said, they come and see me quite often. They sit right here. They sit right where you're sitting. They eat nachos, which they say they can't get where they come from. They do a lot of coke and are very wonderful about a whole range of things. Are they, said Arthur. So, um, when do they come? "'Weekends, mostly,' said Wonko the same, "'on little scooters. "'They're great machines,' he smiled. "'I see,' said Arthur, "'I see. "'About the dolphins,' said Fenchurch gently, hopefully. "'I can show you their sandals,' said Wonko the same. "'I wonder, do you know,' said Arthur, "'would you like me to show you the sandals? "'They're made by the Dr. Shaw Company, "'and the angels say that they particularly suit the terrain they have to work in.' They say they run a concession stand by the message. When I say I don't know what that means, they say, no, you don't, <laughs> and laugh. He walked back towards the inside or the outside, depending on how you looked at it. Arthur and Fenchurch looked at each other in a wondering and slightly desperate sort of way. When Wonko returned, he was carrying something that stunned Arthur, not the sandals. They were perfectly ordinary wooden-bottomed sandals. "'I just thought you'd like to see,' he said, "'what angels wear on their feet. They're "'Just out of curiosity. "'I'm not trying to prove anything, by the way. "'I'm a scientist, and I know what constitutes proof. "'But the reason I call myself by my childhood name "'is to remind myself that a scientist "'must also be absolutely like a child. "'If he sees a thing, he must say that he sees it, "'whether it was what he thought he was going to see or not. "'See first, think later, then test.' He smiled. But 
Always see first. Otherwise, you will only see what you were expecting. <laughs> anyway, I also thought you might like to see this. This was the thing that Arthur had been stunned to see him carrying, for it was a wonderful silver-gray fish-bowl, seemingly identical to the one in Arthur's bedroom. "'Where did you get that?' said Fenchurch, sharply and with a gasp in her voice. Arthur glanced at Fenchurch sharply, and with a gasp in his voice said, "'What? Have you seen one of these before?' "'Oh, yes,' she said, "'I've got one, or at least did have.' "'Russell nicked it to put his golf balls in. "'I don't know where it came from, "'just that I was angry with Russell for nicking it. "'Why, have you got one?' "'Yes, it was—' "'They both became aware that Wonko the Sane "'was glancing sharply backwards and forwards between them "'and trying to get a gasp in edgeways. "'You have one of these, too? he said to both of them. "'Yes,' they both said it. He looked long and calmly at each of them. Then he held up the bowl to catch the light of the Californian sun. The bowl seemed almost to sing with the sun, to chime with the intensity of its light, and cast darkly brilliant rainbows around the sand and upon them. He turned it and turned it. They could see quite clearly in the fine tracery of its etchwork the words, So long, and thanks for all the fish. Do you know, asked Wonko quietly, what it is? They each shook their heads slowly, and with wonder almost hypnotized by the flashing of the lightning shadows in the grey glass. "'It is a farewell gift from the dolphins,' said Wonko, in a low, quiet voice. "'The dolphins whom I loved and studied and swam with and fed with fish and even tried to learn their language, a task which they seemed to make impossibly difficult, considering the fact that I now realize they were perfectly capable of communicating in hours if they decided they wanted to.' He shook his head with a slow, slow smile. "'What have you done with yours?' he said to Arthur. Uh, "'I keep a fish in it,' said Arthur, slightly embarrassed. "'I happen to have this fish I was wondering what to do with, and um, what, there was this bowl,' he tailed off. "'Have you held it to your ear?' asked Wonko. They both shook their heads. "'Perhaps,' he said, "'you should.' The deep roar of the ocean, the break of waves on further shores than thought can find, the silent thunders of the deep. And from among it, voices calling, and yet not voices, humming, trillings, the half-articulated songs of thought. Greetings, waves of greetings, sliding back down into the inarticulate words breaking together. A crash of sorrow on the shores of earth, waves of joy on a world indescribably found, indescribably arrived at, indescribably wet, a song of water. A fugue of voices now, clamouring explanations of a disaster unavertable, a world to be destroyed, a surge of helplessness, a spasm of despair, again the break of words, and then... The fling of hope, the finding of a shadow earth in the implications of enfolded time, submerged dimensions, the pull of parallels, the deep pull, the spin of will, the flight. A new earth pulled into replacement, the dolphins gone. Then, stunningly, a single voice, quite clear, this bowl was brought to you by the campaign to save the humans. We bid you farewell. And then the sound of long, heavy, perfectly grey bodies rolling away into an unknown, fathomless deep, quietly giggling. On the plane on the way home they talked quietly to themselves. I still have to know, said Fenchurch, and I strongly feel that you know something that you're not telling me. Arthur sighed and took out a piece of paper. Do you have a pencil, he said. She dug around and found one. What are you doing, she said, after he had spent twenty minutes frowning, chewing the pencil, scribbling on the paper, crossing things out, and grunting irritably to himself. Trying to remember an address someone once gave me. Your life would be an awful lot simpler, she said, if you bought yourself an address book. Finally, he passed the paper to her. You look after it, he said. She looked at it. Among all the scratchings and crossings out were the words, 
Quenchulous Quasgar Mountains, Seville Bupestry, Planet of Prelium Tarn, Sun Zars, Galactic Sector QQ7. And、uh, what's there? she asked. Apparently, said Arthur, it's God's final message to his creation. Who told you that? A man called Perak. Well, said Fenchurch, that sounds a bit more like it. How do we get there? They went to Arthur's house in the West Country, shoved a couple of towels and stuff in a bag, and then sat down to do what every galactic hitchhiker ends up spending most of his time doing. They waited for a flying saucer to come by. Friend of mine did this for fifteen years," said Arthur one night as they sat forlornly watching the sky. "Who was that? Chap called Ford Prefect." Suddenly, Arthur wondered just where Ford Prefect was at that moment. By an extraordinary coincidence, the following day there were two reports in the paper. One concerned the most astonishing incident with a flying saucer; the other about a series of unseemly riots in pubs. Ford Prefect turned up the day after that, looking hungover and complaining that Arthur never answered the phone. In fact, he looked extremely ill. He staggered into Arthur's sitting room, waving aside all offers of support, which was an error because the effort of waving caused him to lose his balance altogether, and Arthur had eventually to drag him to the sofa. "Thank you," said Ford. "Thank you very much." "Have you?" he said, and fell asleep for three hours. The faintest idea," he continued suddenly when he revived. "How hard it is to tap into the British phone system from the Pleiades! I can see that you haven't. So I'll tell you over the very large mug of black coffee that you are about to make me." He followed Arthur wobbly into the kitchen. Stupid operators keep asking you where you're calling from, and you try and tell them Letchworth, and they say you couldn't be if you're coming in on that circuit. What are you doing? Making you some black coffee. Oh. Ford seemed oddly disappointed. He looked about the place forlornly. What was I saying、uh, about not phoning from Letchworth? I wasn't. I explained to this lady, bugger Letchworth. I said, if that's your attitude, I am in fact calling from a sales scout ship of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation, currently on the sublight speed leg of a journey between the stars known to your world, though not necessarily to you, dear lady, as Pleiades Epsilon and Pleiades Zeta. Have some coffee. Said Arthur, "Thank you, no." And the reason I said why I am bothering you with it rather than just dialing direct, as I could, because we have some pretty sophisticated telecommunications equipment out here in the Pleiades. I can tell you is that the penny-pinching son of a star beast piloting this son of a star beast starship insists that I call collect. Can you believe that? And could she? I don't know. She hung up. Said Ford. So, what do you suppose? He asked fiercely. I did next. I've no idea," Ford said. Arthur, pity," said Ford. "I was hoping you could remind me. I really hate those guys. You know, they really are the creeps of the cosmos, buzzing around the celestial infinite with their junky little machines that never work properly, or when they do, perform functions that no sane man would require of them. And this guy was on a drive to sell more of them. His five-year mission to seek out and explore strange new worlds and sell advanced music substitute systems to their restaurants, elevators, and wine bars, or if they didn't have restaurants, elevators and wine bars yet, to artificially accelerate their civilization growth until they bloody well did have. Where's that coffee? I threw it away. I'll make some more. I have now remembered what I did next. I saved civilization as we know it. I knew it was something like that. He stumbled determinedly back into the sitting room, where he seemed to carry on talking to himself, tripping over the furniture and making beep beep noises. A couple of minutes later, wearing his very placid face, Arthur followed him. Ford looked stunned. "Where have you been?" he demanded. "Making some coffee," said Arthur, still wearing his very placid face. He had long ago realized that the only way of being in Ford's company successfully was to keep a large stock of very placid faces and wear them at all times. "Don't touch that!" yelled Ford. Arthur, who was just about to replace the phone, which was for some mysterious reason lying on the table off the hook, paused placidly. "Okay," said Ford, calming down. "Listen to it." Arthur put the phone to his ear. "It's the speaking clock," he said. Beep, beep, beep.
said Ford, is exactly what is being heard all over that guy's ship while he sleeps in the ice, going slowly round a little known moon of Sisyphus Magna. The London-speaking clock! I see, said Arthur again, and decided that now was the time to ask the big one. Why, he said placidly, with a bit of luck, said Ford, the phone bill will bankrupt the baggers. The flying saucer in which Ford Prefect had stowed away had stunned the world. Finally, there was no doubt, no possibility of mistake, no hallucinations, no mysterious CIA agents found floating in reservoirs. This time it was real. It was definite. It was quite definitely definite. It had come down with a wonderful disregard for anything beneath it, and crushed a large area of some of the most expensive real estate in the world, including much of Harrods. The thing was massive, nearly a mile across, some said, dull silver in colour, pitted, scorched and disfigured with the scars of unnumbered vicious space battles fought with savage forces by the light of suns unknown to man. A hatchway opened crashed down through the Harrods food halls, demolished Harvey Nichols, and with a final grinding scream of tortured architecture, toppled the Sheraton Park Tower. After a long, heart-stopping moment of internal crashes and grumbles of rending machinery, there marched from it, down the ramp, an immense silver robot a hundred feet tall. It held up a hand. "'I come in peace,' it said, adding after a long moment of further grinding, Take me to your lizard. Ford Prefect, of course, had an explanation for this as he sat with Arthur and watched the non-stop frenetic news reports on the television, none of which had anything to say other than to record that the thing had done this amount of damage which was valued at that amount of billions of pounds and had killed this totally other number of people. It comes from a very ancient democracy, you see. You mean it comes from a world of lizards? No, nothing so simple. Nothing... Anything like so straightforward. On its world, the people are people. The leaders are lizards. The people hate the lizards, and the lizards rule the people. Odd, said Arthur. I thought you said it was a democracy. I did, said Ford. It is. So, said Arthur, hoping it wasn't sounding ridiculously obtuse, why don't people get rid of the lizards? It honestly doesn't occur to them, said Ford. They've all got the vote. So they all pretty much assume that the government they voted in more or less approximates to the government they want. You mean they actually vote for the lizards? Oh, yes, said Ford with a shrug. Of course. But, said Arthur, going for the big one again, why? Because if they didn't vote for a lizard, said Ford, the wrong lizard might get in. What? Some people say that the lizards are the best thing that ever happened to them. They're completely wrong, of course, completely and utterly wrong, but someone's got to say it. But that's terrible, said Arthur. Listen, bud, said Ford, if I had one Altarian dollar for every time I heard one bit of the universe look at another bit of the universe and say, that's terrible, I wouldn't be sitting here like a lemon, looking for a gin. But I haven't, and I am. Anyway... What are you looking so placid and moon-eyed for? Are you in love? Arthur said yes, he was, and said it placidly. With someone who knows where the gin bottle is, do I get to meet her? He did, because Fenchurch came in at that moment with a pile of newspapers she'd been into the village to buy. She stopped in astonishment at the wreckage on the table and the wreckage from Beetlejuice on the sofa. Where's the gin, said Ford to Fenchurch? And to Arthur, what happened to Trillian, by the way? Um, this is Fenchurch, said Arthur, awkwardly. Uh, there was nothing with Trillian. You must have seen her last. Oh, yeah, said Ford. She went off with Zaphod somewhere. They had some kids or something. At least, he added, I think that's what they were. Zaphod's calmed down a lot, you know. Really, said Arthur, clustering hurriedly round Fenchurch to relieve her of the shopping. Yeah, said Ford. At least one of his heads is now saner than an emu on acid. "'Arthur, who is this?' said Fenchurch. "'Ford Prefect,' said Arthur. "'I may have mentioned him in passing.' "'For a total of three days and nights, "'the giant silver robot stood in stunned amazement "'straddling the remains of Knightsbridge, "'swaying slightly and trying to work out a number of things. 
Government deputations came to see it. Ranting journalists by the truckload asked each other questions on the air about what they thought of it. Flights of fighter bombers tried pathetically to attack it, but no lizards appeared. Early on the fourth day, it became apparent that the robot was preparing to leave for good. The point is, said Fenchurch to Ford, can you get us on board? Ford looked wildly at his watch. I have some serious unfinished business to attend to, he exclaimed. Crowds thronged as close as they could to the giant silver craft, which wasn't very. The giant robot had lurched back aboard the ship at lunchtime, and now it was five o'clock in the afternoon, and no further sign had been seen of it. Much had been heard, grindings and rumblings from deep within the craft, the music of a million hideous malfunctions, but the sense of tense expectation among the crowd was born of the fact that they tensely expected it to be disappointed. This wonderful, extraordinary thing had come into their lives, and now it was simply going to go without them. Two people were particularly aware of this sensation. Arthur and Fenchurch scanned the crowd anxiously, unable to find Ford Prefect in it anywhere, or any sign that he had the slightest intention of being there. "'How reliable is he?' asked Fenchurch in a sinking voice. "'How reliable?' said Arthur. He gave a hollow laugh. "'How shallow is the ocean?' he said. "'How cold is the sun?' Hopelessly, and with no clear plan now, Arthur and Fenchurch pushed forward through the crowd, but since the whole crowd was also trying to push forward through the crowd, this got them nowhere. A few seconds passed. The sounds of mechanical disarray from within changed in intensity, and slowly, heavily, the huge steel ramp began to lift itself back out of the Harrods' food halls. The sound that accompanied it was the sound of thousands of tense, excited people being completely ignored. "'Hold it!' A megaphone barked from a taxi which screeched to a halt on the edge of the milling crowd. "'There has been,' barked the megaphone, "'a major scientific break-in! A through! Breakthrough!' it corrected itself. The door flew open, and Ford Prefect leapt out wearing a white coat. "'Hold it!' he shouted again, and this time he brandished a short, squat black rod with lights on it. The lights winked briefly. The ramp paused in its ascent, and then, in obedience to the signals from the rod, slowly ground its way downwards again. Ford Prefect grabbed his megaphone from out of the taxi and started bawling at the crowd through it. "'Make way!' he shouted. "'Make way, please! This is a major scientific breakthrough! You and you, get the equipment from the taxi!' Completely at random, he pointed at Arthur and Fenchurch, who wrestled their way back out of the crowd and clustered urgently around the taxi. "'All right, I want you to clear a passage, please, for some important pieces of scientific equipment,' boomed Ford. "'Just everybody keep calm. It's all under control. There's nothing to see. It is merely a major scientific breakthrough. Keep calm now. Important scientific equipment. Clear the way!' Hungry for new excitement, delighted at this sudden reprieve from disappointment, the crowd enthusiastically fell back and started to open up. Arthur was a little surprised to see what was printed on the boxes of important scientific equipment in the back of the taxi. "'Hang your coat over them,' he muttered to Fenchurch as he heaved them out to her. Hurriedly he manoeuvred out the large supermarket trolley that was also jammed against the back seat. It clattered to the ground, and together they loaded the boxes into it. "'Clear a path, please!' shouted Ford again. "'Everything's under proper scientific control!' The crowd surged and closed behind them again, as frantically they pushed and hauled the rattling supermarket trolley through the rubble towards the ramp. "'It's all right,' Ford continued to bellow. "'There is nothing to see. It's all over. None of this is actually happening.' And then, very suddenly, as the crowd began to close in again, he shouted, "'Walkmen!' and pulled half a dozen miniature tape players from his pockets and tossed them into the crowd. The resulting seconds of utter confusion allowed them to get the supermarket trolley to the edge of the ramp and to haul it up onto the lip of it. "'Hold tight,' muttered Ford, and released a button on his electronic rod. Beneath them the huge ramp juddered and began slowly to heave its way upwards. "'Okay, kids,' he said as the milling crowd dropped away beneath them, and they started to lurch their way along the tilting ramp into the bowels of the ship. "'Looks like we're on our way.' Beyond what used to be known as the limitless light fields of Flanux, 
Until the grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine were discovered, lying behind them lie the grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine. Within the grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine lies the star named Zars, around which orbits the planet Prelium Tarn, in which is the land of Sevor Bupstri. And it was to the land of Sevor Bupstri that Arthur and Fenchurch came at last, a little tired by the journey. And in the land of Sevor Bupstri they came to the great red plain of Raz, which was bounded on the south side by the quenchulous Quasgar Mountains, on the further side of which, according to the dying words of Prack, they would find in thirty-foot-high letters of fire God's final message to his creation. According to Prack, if Arthur's memory served him right, the place was guarded by the majestic Vantrachel of Lob, and so, after a manner, it proved to be. He was a little man in a strange hat, and he sold them a ticket. "'Keep to the left, please,' he said. "'Keep to the left.' and he hurried on past them on a little scooter. They realized that they were not the first to pass that way, for the path that led around the left of the great plain was well worn and dotted with booths. At one they bought a box of fudge, at another they bought some postcards. The letters had been blurred with an airbrush, so as not to spoil the big surprise, it said on the reverse. Do you know what the message is? they asked the wizened little lady in the booth. Oh, yes, she piped cheerily. Oh, yes. They drank a couple of sodas in the shade of the booth and then trudged out into the sun again. Some way ahead of them an awkward, low shape was heaving itself wretchedly along the ground, stumbling painfully slowly, half limping, half crawling. It was moving so slowly that before too long they caught the creature up and could see that it was made of worn, scarred and twisted metal. It groaned at them as they approached it, collapsing in the hot, dry dust. "'So much time,' it groaned. "'Oh, so much time. And pain as well. So much of that, and so much time to suffer it in too. One or the other on its own I could probably manage. It's the two together that really get me down. Oh, hello.' "'You again.' "'Marvin,' said Arthur, sharply, crouching down beside it, "'is that you?' "'What is it?' whispered Fenchurch in alarm, "'crouching behind Arthur and grasping onto his arm. Well, he, "'He's sort of an old friend,' said Arthur. "'Marvin tried to twist himself up on his misshapen elbows. "'Is there any last service you would like me to perform for you, perhaps?' "'he asked in a kind of hollow rattle. "'A piece of paper that perhaps you'd like me to pick up for you. "'Or maybe you'd like me to open a door. "'Don't seem to be any doors around at present, "'but I'm sure that if we waited long enough, someone would build one.' "'Arthur!' hissed Fenchurch in his ear sharply. "'You never told me of this. "'What have you done to this poor creature?' "'Nothing,' insisted Arthur sadly. "'He's always like this.' "'Huh!' snapped Marvin. What do you know of always? You say always to me, who, because of the silly little errands your organic life forms keep on sending me through time on, am now thirty-seven times older than the universe itself. <laughs> he rasped his way through a coughing fit and resumed. Leave me, he said. Go on ahead. Leave me to struggle painfully on my way. My time at last is nearly come. My race is nearly run. Between them they picked him up despite his feeble protests and insults. The metal was so hot it nearly blistered their fingers, but he weighed surprisingly little and hung limply between their arms. They carried him with them along the path that ran along the left of the great red plain of Raz towards the encircling mountains of Quenchulus Quasgar. They tried to see if they could get him some spare parts at one of the booths and some soothing oil, but Marvin would have none of it. "'I'm all spare parts,' he droned. "'Every part of me has been replaced at least fifty times.' They rounded the foot of the Quenchulus Quasgar mountains, and there was the message, written in blazing letters along the crest of the mountain. 
There was a little observation vantage point with a rail built along the top of a large rock facing it from which you could get a good view. They gazed at God's final message in wonderment and were slowly and ineffably filled with a great sense of peace and a final and complete understanding. Fenchurch sighed. Yes, that was it. They had been staring at it for fully ten minutes before they became aware that Marvin, hanging between their shoulders, was slowly spelling out the message letter by letter. He read the E, the N, the C, and at last the final E, and slumped heavily in their arms. We apologize for the inconvenience he murmured at last, from deep within his corroding, rattling thorax. I, I think I feel good about it. The lights went out in his eyes, for absolutely the very last time ever. Luckily there was a stall nearby where you could rent scooters from guys with green wings. The Epilogue one of the greatest benefactors of all life kind was a man who couldn't keep his mind on the job in hand. Brilliant? Certainly. One of the foremost genetic engineers of his or any other generation, including a number he had designed himself? Without a doubt. The problem was that he was far too interested in things which he shouldn't be interested in. At least, as people would tell him, not now. He was also, partly because of this, of a rather irritable disposition. So, when his world was threatened by terrible invaders from a distant star, who were still a fair way off but travelling fast, he, Blart Versenwald III, his name was Blart Versenwald III, which is not strictly relevant but quite interesting because, never mind, that was his name and we can talk about why it's interesting later, was sent into guarded seclusion by the masters of his race with instructions to design a breed of fanatical super-warriors to resist and vanquish the feared invaders. Do it quickly and, they told him, concentrate. So he sat by a window and looked out at a summer lawn, and designed, and designed, and designed, but inevitably got a little distracted by things, and by the time the invaders were practically in orbit round them, had come up with a remarkably new breed of superfly, that could, unaided, figure out how to fly through the open half of a half-open window, and also an off-switch for children. Celebrations of these remarkable achievements seemed doomed to be short-lived because disaster was imminent as the alien ships were landing. But astoundingly, the fearsome invaders, who, like most warlike races, were only on the rampage because they couldn't cope with things at home, were stunned by Versenwald's extraordinary breakthroughs, joined in the celebrations, and were instantly prevailed upon to sign a wide-ranging series of trading agreements and set up a program of cultural exchanges. And, in an astonishing reversal of normal practice in the conduct of such matters, everybody concerned lived happily ever after. There was a point to this story, but it has temporarily escaped the chronicler's mind. <laughs>